I, as I said before, I love plants where they have a multi-purpose, where you get food and medicine and multiple medicines from different parts of the plant. So nettles to me is just this superstar when it comes to herbal medicine. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I've learned so much from David Winston over the years, so it was an absolute pleasure to have him on the podcast. He's knowledgeable, witty, and a wonderful storyteller who shares many insights about nettles, but also about other important pearls of wisdom about herbalism and herbs. For those of you who don't know David, he's an herbalist and ethnobotanist with 54 years of training in Chinese, Western eclectic, and Southeastern herbal traditions. He's been in clinical practice for 47 years and is an herbal consultant to physicians, herbalists, and researchers throughout the USA, Europe, and Canada. David is the founder and director of the Herbal Therapeutics Research Library and the dean of David Winston Center for Herbal Studies, a two-year training program in clinical herbal medicine. He's an internationally known lecturer and frequently teaches at medical schools, professional symposia, and herb conferences. He's the president of Herbalist and Alchemist Inc., a manufacturer that produces herbal products that blend the art and science of the world's great herbal traditions. In addition, David is a founding and professional member of the American Herbalist Guild, and he is on the American Botanical Council and the American Herbal Pharmacopeia Advisory Boards. He's the author of many books, including the co-author of Adaptogens, Herbs for Strength, Stamina, and Stress Relief, as well as the co-author of Herbal Therapy and Supplements, a Scientific and Traditional Approach. David has taught thousands of herbalists around the world and is the recipient of many notable and prestigious awards and fellowships. Well, welcome to the show, David. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Rosalie. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this and thank you so much for asking me to share my experience and passion with your listeners. Oh, yes, absolutely. I've been, I feel like I've just been like, steeping in this world of David Winston for the past several days, just getting really excited for this conversation. And something I've been thinking about is just how much over almost well, over half a century you've been embodying your path as this herbalist and ethnobotanist, whether that's through your personal achievements with your incredible teaching career all the awards you've won, honorary doctorate, as well as the many contributions you've given to us as herbalists through your books, through the David Winston uh, Center for Herbal Studies, and all of the people you've trained as practitioners, as well as your incredible formulations in Herbalist and Alchemist. So that's just a lot to think about, but I want to start all the way back at the beginning um, and hear how young David found himself along this path. Well, I feel really blessed and really fortunate. I've met so many people in my life and, you know, here they are, they're in their 20s or 30s or 40s, and they're still trying to figure out what they want to do when they grow up. <laughs> well, I fell in love with plants at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And one of my first experiences, I was about 11 years old. And I was at a summer camp and someone showed us this edible plant. And I didn't remember what it was called, but I remembered what it tasted like. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and it had this wonderful lemon lime kind of tart flavor. And I've always enjoyed sour things much more than sweet things. And I was intrigued and I decided I wanted to find out what this thing was. And it took me a few years, but I eventually found out that the plant I had tried was wood sorrel. Mm -hmm. And I was just fascinated. And I came across this book called Stalking the Wild Asparagus by Yule Gibbons, which had actually been published in the 60s, but it hadn't been very popular. And all of a sudden, and here we are in the late uh, 60s. Uh, so it was published in the early 60s. Here it is, the late 60s. And I come across this book and I read it and it just blew my mind. It was just like, wow, you mean you can walk out into the woods and into the fields? And I'd always grown up in areas where there was woods behind my house or nearby or farms. So I spent a lot of my childhood walking through the woods. Um, suffice to say... I was not your average child um, for a number of reasons. If I was younger, I would have been diagnosed as having ADHD as well as dyslexia. But when I was a kid, there were no such things. So they just, I had problems learning. Um, I also was exceedingly shy and an introvert, which is not probably the best combination and so I was also the little kid that had the sign on their back that said, kick me, beat me up and steal your lunch money. Oh, David. <laughs> well, that actually, ha that did happen. Um, and so I was not comfortable with people, hmm. but plants hmm. and trees and rocks and things like that, they spoke to me. I actually remember making concoctions in my backyard, picking plants. And I actually remember some of the plants. I didn't know what they were called then, but one of the main ones was plantain. And I'd make it in this concoction in a bucket in my back of my house and I'd mash it up with water. And when my mother would say, what are you doing? I said, I'm making medicine. <laughs> so anyway, some years pass. And um, I read Yule Gibbon's book. Then I read his second book, Stalking the Healthful Herbs. And I was sold. It was just, I literally fell in love with this idea that I could go outside into the woods, into the fields, find medicine, find food. And it was just the most fascinating thing in the world to me. And so I started to look for where I could learn more. I'm 13 years old at this point. I will also mention <laughs> that at that age, I also had read one other really important book. It was important to me. And that was um, Carlos Castaneda's book. Now, I understand that that book is controversial and a lot of people claim that it's not real. But at the time, I didn't know anything about that. And so I also went on a phase from 13 to 14 years old where I tried every plant uh, hallucinogen that I could get my hands on. <laughs> and there were companies then, there was one out of California called Legal Highs, and you could buy all sorts of stuff. You could buy ayahuasca and you could buy, you know, uh, baby Hawaiian baby wood rose seeds, and you could just buy all sorts of things that today you probably couldn't necessarily get. But the thing is, I wasn't trying to get high. That wasn't my purpose at all. I had read this book and it was about altering consciousness, and I was trying to do the same thing. What I found after a year, though, is that I was sort of doing, I guess, what it says in the Bible, casting your pearls before swine, in the sense that I didn't understand these medicines. Yes, my intent was good, but I didn't know the songs. I didn't know the proper ceremonies. I didn't know, understand how to prepare them properly. So I managed to make myself violently ill any number of times. And I gave up on that idea of doing that. But I still felt that plants were a way of not only helping other people, but helping me to become the person that I wanted to become. And so that set me off on this journey. And at that time, I was unaware of any schools of herbal medicine. There was a very long period of time where I thought I was the only herbalist on the East Coast. I was not, but the other herbalists were mostly much, much older than I was, and they were mostly 
sort of tucked away into rural communities. So they may have been known in their local community, people like Catfish Gray in West Virginia, or Tommy Bass in Alabama, or Evelyn Snook in Pennsylvania, in the middle of Pennsylvania, or somebody like um, um, just, just these people that most people don't really know about. Uh, they, they existed, but I just had no way of finding out about them. And so what I would do is I would buy every book I could find on herbal medicine and read it cover to cover. The only problem was most of the books published in the late 60s and early 70s weren't very good. And I had no way of knowing whether the information was valid or not. And so what I did is I taught myself field botany so I could go out and identify plants, although I must admit I made some very funny, luckily non-fatal <laughs> errors. And I would go and try, gather plants and I would make medicine out of them and I would try them and I would experiment on myself to see what they actually did and whether they were effective. And I have lots of, not that we have time for today, but I have lots of funny stories about things that worked, things that didn't work. Um, believe me, I know Senna. <laughs> I bought it at my local health food store. But when I read Back to Eden by Jethro Klaus, he doesn't really go into a lot of detail about proper dosing. <laughs> and so, yes, to this day, I, I know Santa. I have a gut feeling about that plant. It's just that's how it started. And I never stopped. I never lost the passion, even though when I was younger, people would say to me, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm an herbalist. And they'd look at me because this kind of puzzled look and they'd say you mean like spices and i'd go no although most spices are indeed herbs and they'd say if somebody was really smart and knowledgeable they might say you mean like potpourri and i'd go no medicinal plants and i could see them shaking their head going poor misguided youth why would you waste your time doing something that people did a hundred years ago nobody does that anymore it would be like me telling them I was learning to, you know, deliver blocks of ice for their ice box or light the gas lamps at night. You know, it was pretty much at this time frame, it was pretty much extinct. There really was virtually no herbal medicine. And the first time that I actually took a class with somebody was Dr. Christopher. Hmm. And thank goodness, even though what he practiced was very basic sort of Neo-Thompsonian herbal medicine, this herb for this disease kind of thing. And that's not, I, I really don't think the way herbs work the best. I honor him because he and, and, and some of his um, compatriots, mostly from Utah, kept herbal medicine alive at a time where it was at its absolute nadir, at its lowest point. And so, I just kept going and had the opportunity to learn in various traditions and, and from various people. And thankfully, eventually the rest of the world became interested as well. Hmm. Now just hearing your, you know, experimenting and trying all these things, it makes me realize as a younger generation, how much I've benefited from that, because I have not been the one that's been excited to experiment with Senna or anything else. But I have learned so much from you and that a lot of that, you know, comes from your many years of, of, of experience. I also just really wanted to mention too, that I love that it began with the taste of wood sorrel, because I have personally learned so much from you about energetics and taste. So I love that that was like a, such a big spark for you back when mm -hmm. you were 11. Well, I'm so excited to talk about everything nettle. It was kind of a request on my part because uh, you have some unique contributions to our understanding of nettle that I'm excited to talk about. But there's so much to talk about nettle, so I'm just going to let you dive in wherever you want to dive in. Great. So one of the things I really appreciate about nettles, it's not the only plant like this. I really like weedy plants where you get multiple medicines from the same plant. And so most people are familiar with nettles, of course, Urtica dioica. Uh, they're familiar with the, using the leaf, but nettles is one of these plants where not only is the leaf a medicine, but the root is a medicine. And the root, what the root does is totally different than what the leaf does. And then there is the seed. And we'll save that for last, but because that, that one is, is really, really special to me for, for multiple reasons. So I, I would say that nettle leaf was one of the very early plants that I learned um, 
And I, again, have some pretty humorous stories about nettle leaf. I, I will share one of them with you. Um, it is, of course, also known as stinging nettle. And that is because the little hairs on the stem and leaves can contain formic acid. And they actually inject it into your skin. And it causes what's known as a nettle rash. And so many, many years ago, um, when, oh, I don't know, this would have been probably sometime... Hmm, early 1990s, so probably about 30 years ago, could have been the late 1980s, sometime around then. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I have an herb company, Herbalist and Alchemist, and while I don't run the lab anymore, I still formulate all the products and things like that. Anyway, a friend of mine used to help me in the laboratory when I used to run the laboratory, and he also uh, was teaching me, I was teaching him about herbal medicine, and he was teaching me Lung Yung Pai, Southern Praying Mantis Kung Fu. And we would, we would uh, work in the lab, processing whatever needed to be processed that day. And then at the end of the day, we'd go outside and we'd practice the Kung Fu. And one day we go outside and he says to him, and, and, and we, we started to spar a little bit, and he kept holding his shoulder. I said, what's the matter? And his name was Russell. I said, Russell, what's the matter? And he said, oh, I was working out last night on the heavy bag and I, I pulled something in my shoulder. It's really painful. I said, Russell, you know, because where we were, there was a lovely nettles patch. I said, Russell, you know, there's this old tradition in herbal medicine, European herbal medicine, and it's known as ertification. And what you do is you take a bunch of nettles and you whack like a stiff, sore joint. And it increases the blood flow and it helps to, you know, to make it feel better. I said, you want to try it? He said, sure. That sounds great. <laughs> I love the level of trust here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I put on a glove. I took some, I gathered some fresh nettles and I whacked his shoulder, his right shoulder. And I have never in my life seen somebody respond as intensely as he did to nettles. I mean, his whole shoulder swelled up. It was red. It was blistered. It was not great looking. And so then I said to him, and this sounds really bad, but we were good friends. And he, Russell was one of those people that he would literally try anything. I said, you know, Russell, there's all this folklore about nettles. What's good for nettle rash? And I said, and I have this theory that this plant that's right over there would be really good, but it's, I've never read about it. I'd like to try it. I said, can we do an experiment? I'll whack your other shoulder, the one that's not problematic, and we'll try different things to see what be works best for the nettle rash. He said, that sounds great. <laughs> Seriously. So I whack his other shoulder with it, and it too balloons up. It looks like he's wearing red shoulder pads at this point. Wow. So what I did is there was this plant that I had known for decades, which is called jewelweed in patients by flora um, or uh, um, or what's the other one or pallida by patients in patients pallida. And um, if you crush it up and you put it on poison ivy, uh, if you put it on before you get poison ivy, actually, if you've been in contact with it, it helps prevent you from getting poison ivy, although it's not very effective once you actually have poison ivy, at least in my experience. But I always felt like it would be great for nettle rash, but I'd never read about it being used for that. So I took some jewelweed, I crushed it up, put it all over his right shoulder, and literally within five minutes, the redness, the blistering, gone. <laughs> I'd never seen anything work so well for nettle rash. So then we tried some of the other traditional things. We tried on his left shoulder. We tried plantain leaf. It helped a little bit. Not, not impressive. We tried... Um, a yellow dock leaf, not particularly impressive. So then I said, well, all right, let's just try the, the jewel weed. And we put it on his other shoulder. And sure enough, the redness and the swelling fairly shortly uh, uh, dissipated. And so it, it gave me this great appreciation of nettle uh, for its ability to, you know, increase circulation. And at the same time, it taught me this great lesson about this plant that I was quite familiar with, but had this use that I was totally unfamiliar with. And when we were all done with this wonderful experiment, I said, oh, by the way, Russell, how's your shoulder? Because that was the point in the first place. Right. And he moved around and said, pain's gone. Hmm. So 
Nettle is this amazing plant. Now, yes, it can be used topically. It's a rather heroic uh, treatment. I wouldn't recommend it for the uh, uh, faint of heart. And, and, and you don't need to do treatments that are that intense. But I will say, I know people who have like really bad arthritic hands. A lot of people who are body workers after 10 or 15 or 20 years of doing body work, they get a lot of arthritis in their hands. And I had a friend that would get bee venom therapy get stung by bees and his hands would swell up for a day or two, but then the arthritis would be gone for like a month, a month and a half. And one time I mentioned to him, I said, you know, we should try seeing if nettles would work. And actually the nettles worked just as well as the bee sting, except the nettles tended to cause a little bit of blistering where the bee stings just caused redness and swelling, but it actually worked for that as well. <laughs> So nettle leaf, on, on the other hand, and, and, and I will warn our viewers, there are some people who will tell people that if you take nettle leaves and you roll them up to a tight ball, you can chew on it and suck the juice out of it or eat it. I do not recommend that process at all because I know people who have tried it and had nettle stings in their throat. Oh. And it was horrendous. Um, so I, I wouldn't recommend that, but dried, when you dry nettle leaves, it loses that stinging quality. And so nettle leaf, most of people in the herbal community think that nettle leaf is super rich in iron. It does contain easily absorbable iron, but the reality is the iron levels of nettle leaf are nowhere as high as people think they are. And nettle actually contains more, um, uh, calcium than it does iron. And so one of my favorite uses for nettle leaf is to use it in combination. And I gave you a recipe, which is a basically a spice blend, but that spice blend not only is really flavorful, but it is nutrient dense and it can be used among other things to help prevent things like osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. um, I use a combination of nettle leaf alfalfa leaf, spring gathered dandelion, horsetail, and then usually I'll throw in some, you know, maybe a Chinese herb or two, maybe like a teasel root or uh, acaranthes or eucomia dujung, and use this formula for treating people who have our early stage osteoporosis, Clinically, I've been using that some variation of that formula for about 40 some odd years. And I have in my case files, lots of before and after x-rays showing before x-rays bone that looks like lace and is demineralized. Two years later, remineralized bone. And now more recently, uh, over the last 30 years, instead of x-rays, DEXA scans showing the exact same thing. It takes 18 months to two years to do it. And if you have bone loss, meaning if you have loss of bone in the jaw, the hip, wherever, that's not coming back. But if the bone is still there, not only can it slow burn uh, bone turnover, it can actually help to remineralize bone. Um, and it works incredibly well. And so that is one of the things that I love using nettles for. I also use it for uh, people who have fractures. I've used it. I, when I say this, I'm guesstimating because I don't really count, but hundreds at least times where people had fractures, where they are given that formula and their fracture almost invariably heals in about half the time expected and it heals really well. I've had opportunities where I had people who had fractures that refused to heal, where we use that formula along with electro stim. It could be electro acupuncture or a TENS unit or whatever. So electrical stimulation to the area of the fracture. And most of the time, the bone will heal. So um, it is absolutely a remarkable plant. And in addition, and again, we're going to get to the fact that you can use the leaf, the root and the seed. Let's not forget that it's also an edible plant. Mm -hmm. And so cooked nettle greens, the, the, um, uh, the fresh greens when cooked, can be used in almost any recipe where you might have some spinach in it, although it has a different consistency than spinach. It's a bit more granular. 
Um, so you might not necessarily want to use all nettle. You might want to put some nettle, some spinach or something like that. But for instance, if you make, um, back in, in, in the early days before I realized I was allergic to dairy, uh, and I went through my brief vegetarian phase. This would be when I was about 17, 18, 19. I used to make this um, uh, dish that was either like a lasagna or a manicotte or stuffed shells, stuffed with like three kinds of cheeses and uh, spinach and nettle leaves and really good. Oh, by the way, totally off topic. If you want to make the best tomato sauce ever, Use a little bit, instead of oregano, use Menarda didyma leaves. Ooh, nice tip. Mm, 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 mm. Not a ton, but really good. Anyway, <laughs> now oregano is oregano. So um, <clears throat> the fact that it is also, you know, uh, uh, edible. And then the word nettles comes from the old, old English net meaning rope. And you can actually, and I've done this, I've never tried making a, a bowstring out of it, but you could actually make a bowstring. It's that strong because bowstring needs incredible structural integrity uh, to be functional out of nettles cordage. Um, I've seen, um, there was a video online about this man who made a dress. Mm, I've uh, seen that, yeah. Yeah out of nettle fiber and it was just magnificent and i'll tell you something that dress could probably last 50 70 years nettle fiber is so incredibly strong so here we have this plant that is routinely despised because i will tell you this you don't want to plant nettles in your garden unless you want to have a garden it is pretty much nothing but nettles. Not only can it spread by seed, it spreads by rhizome, underground runners, and it is incredibly invasive. So I always tell people, if you're going to plant nettles, put it someplace where you don't care if it spreads. Um, and of course, it stings. So people spend probably, I don't know, certainly uh, millions of dollars a year trying to eradicate this plant when it is such an incredible blessing, a food, a medicine, multiple medicines, economic uses, what is not to love about a plant like that? And that is so many of our weedy plants, burdock, where the seed, the root and the leaf are medicines and the stalk is edible, uh, dandelion, where you have the flower, the leaf and the root. I, as I said before, I love plants where they have a multi-purpose, where you get food and medicine and multiple medicines from different parts of the plant. So nettles to me is just this superstar when it comes to herbal medicine. And in the wider culture, it's not all that well appreciated, but I think among herbalists it is. But what I would say, and, and, and just a few more things maybe about the leaf, uh, nettle leaf is a aquaretic, and for anyone who doesn't know the term, an aquaretic is a non-irritating potassium-sparing diuretic. Uh, it's a lot easier to just say aquaretic. <laughs> and so it is for people who, for instance, want to lower blood pressure. Uh, aquaretics are one of the first things you might want to try because if you lower the volume of fluids in the body, you reduce blood pressure. And in fact, a study it was done with pharmaceutical um, blood pressure medications. I believe it was done with hydrochlorothiazide, but the All Hat study, it came out in 2002. Um, the authors of that study, and this study was done on something like, I don't know, several hundred thousand people. They found that uh, in this case, pharmaceutical diuretics work just as well as beta blockers and ACE inhibitors for lowering blood pressure with a significantly reduced cost and very great, much, much fewer adverse effects. Well, the same thing is true of aquaretics, except that unlike hydrochlorothiazide, they don't deplete potassium because they actually contain more potassium than you excrete. So nettle leaf is a great aquaretic. Nettle leaf is also used for a number of other things. Uh, for instance, for people with hematuria, 
So that's blood in the urine, whether it is coming from the kidney. Now, I mean, if somebody has a ton of blood in their urine, you need to go to the doctor and find out why. But for somebody with trace amounts of blood in their urine, somebody who runs marathons, many marathoners after 26 miles running on hard concrete will often have blood in the urine for the week after the marathon. Take nettles, it'll stop that. So it stops uh, bleeding both in the kidney and in the bladder. Um, nettle also has significant anti-inflammatory effects. And in, uh, in fact, a clinical trial done in the last couple of years showed that a nettle capsule had significant benefits for knee arthritis, which is the most common uh, type of arthritis. Um, and of course, and here you don't have to whack yourself with it. You can just take the dried herb <laughs> internally. Um, and the eclectics, the, for those listeners who are not familiar, viewers who are not familiar, the eclectics were MDs who primarily practiced herbal medicine who existed from the 1820s through the 1930s. And I am a big fan of their medicine and their work, them and the physiomedicalists who were the two primary herbal medicine sects in the United States, S-E-C-T-S. Um, their work is phenomenal. And, you know, any American herbalist, well, actually around the world, but certainly American herbalist who doesn't go back and look at our forebearers uh, and see what they did in this rich history that they left us about using plants is, is really missing an incredible resource. But the eclectics especially like to use nettles for skin that either tears easily or that bruises easily. So you just, you know, you go like that and all of a sudden you've got a bruise. So for those sorts of things, nettle leaf, again, skin that kind of tears easily or looks or feels like paper, like parchment. People who maybe, you know, were sun worshippers and got way too much sun or also, you know, skin that bleeds very easily and you really easily develop bruises, hematomas. Um, think of nettles for that as well. And so those are some of my favorite uses of nettles. And I, I mentioned earlier about, you know, the fact that it has way more calcium than it has iron. But still think about something like a nettles with some parsley leaf, maybe a little bit of yellow dock or something like that for somebody with a, you know, iron deficiency. Um, it can be a benefit there as well. So I don't know. Those are just probably some of my favorite uses. If I really wanted to think about it, I'm sure I could come up with, uh, with more, but, um, David, before you move on to the root, which I'm just guessing you're about to do, I yeah. do want to highlight the recipe that you shared with us, mm -hmm. the green powder spice blend, because this looks so delicious. There is nettle leaf in there, parsley, like you've been talking about. Uh, that combination is great. Uh, there's dulse, there's onion powder, garlic powder, black pepper, so many wonderful things. And uh, thank you so much for sharing that recipe, us, recipe with us. And for the listeners, if you'd like to download your free recipe handout, then you can visit the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. I also wanted to mention that, that um, the nettle horsetail combination that you were mentioning before, specifically for fra fractures and arthritis, um, I'm a big fan of that formulation and people might not know, but they can get that in capsule form from herbalists and alchemists called Osteo Herb. So I just wanted to mention that too, in case someone didn't know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that formula, as I said, HNA has been making it for probably about 20 years, but I've probably used it for close to 40 years, maybe even slightly longer than that. Um, you know, I started studying herbal medicine this year will be 54 years. And I guess I've been in practice now for about 45. So I'd say probably about 40 years I've been using that formula or some variation of that formula and it just continues to astonish me what herbs are capable of doing. And, and the story of nettle seed takes that even further. We'll get to that in a little bit. But it, it just amazes me because when you look at people and they're taking medications like Fosamax or things like that, which inhibits bone remodeling, well, the problem is then you really have dead bone and it becomes really brittle bone. So yeah, you don't develop osteoporosis, but 
there's a high likelihood of developing fractures and things like that. And so here we have these very simple things that can make such a huge difference. If you have somebody who has a family history of osteoporosis, uh, you know, I'll just put them on a maintenance dose of the osteo herb and just keep them on the maintenance dose. There's no downside to it. You know, the downside is you're going to increase your ferritin levels, your iron levels, your salicylic acid levels, your potassium levels. I mean, unless you have somebody who for, you know, has degenerative kidney disease and can't have potassium or something like that, there are, you know, a, a, a number of situations where that that's, might not be indicated. But, you know, I always tell people the side effects of taking that product, because it takes about 18 months to two years to fully have that effect, especially if you're trying to remineralize bone. But there are things you notice within a very short period of time, well, short comparatively, two to three months, where all of a sudden you notice your fingernails are stronger. And like if you had somebody who had their fingernails break easily or they flake, they get better. And their hair gets nicer and it stops breaking off and they get less split ends. And they start having stronger teeth and stronger enamel. Uh, on their teeth, less cavities. That formula, including the nettles, not only strengthens bone, but hair, nails, skin. So it is a remarkable formula that is easy to take and just works incredibly well. And so I just love that herbs can do these things. And uh, you might notice that I get enthusiastic about this stuff. You know, I've been doing this for, as I said, 54 years. And it is just as exciting to me and fascinating now as it was back then. So, for mm -hmm. instance, just to give an example, I'm, I'm going to be on a panel um, in March or the Southwest Conference of Botanical Medicine where I'm on, on a panel with some other great people. And we're doing a panel on treating people with medium and long COVID. And it's just like, here are all these people who are suffering and orthodox medicine unfortunately doesn't have a lot of answers at the moment you know they're still trying to figure it out and yet i know dozens of herbalists who instead of you know okay studies are great I, believe me i love studies but i've got patients who have problems now and the nice thing is is that like we can try things that are unlikely to have any significant adverse effects. And the beauty of it is a lot of these things work incredibly well. Hmm. So to me, it is just about sharing this information, sharing it as widely as possible so that everybody has access to this, because this truly is not only our first medicine, no matter who you are and where you come from, but it's the people's medicine. Hmm. You don't need a patent. It doesn't have to be super expensive. You can learn to make your own medicines and you can learn to, either, you know, many of these things are easy to grow. Even if you live in an apartment building, you just have a little balcony. You can still grow these things. You can learn to make medicines at home. <sighs> I love it. <laughs> it, it. It is just so empowering. And the, mm -hmm. the only sad thing is, you know, when I first started studying herbal medicine, as I said earlier, you know, herbal medicine was so far out in left field, it was in a totally different field altogether. And it's much better known today. All right. I mean, everybody's heard. I don't get those phone calls anymore. What's this herb, Echinacea? <laughs> that was a real phone call. Um, everybody's heard of Echinacea and everybody's heard of salt palmetto and almost everybody's heard of black cohosh or turmeric. The problem is certain herbs have become popular, but herbal medicine has not. Most people still don't really understand that herbal medicine, yes, you can take, you know, somebody says, hey, I have a tummy ache. What's good for that? You can say, here, try some ginger. And there's a good chance that, you know, it may help. But if they come back the next day and the next day and the next day and they still have a stomach ache, then you're not treating the underlying issue. You're not treating the person. You're treating the disease. And Hippocrates is believed to have said, and Moses Maimonides, the great uh, uh, Jewish physician, uh, uh, Yunani Tib sort of uh, Jewish physician, did say something like, it's more important to know the person that has the disease than the disease the person has. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And so whoever said it first, <laughs> Hippocrates 2000 plus years ago, or Moses Maimonides, and probably any number of other people uh, in between, it is true. That's where herbal medicine works best. Herbal medicine works best treating people rather than treating diseases. So I could have 10 people all diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. They're not 10 rheumatoid arthritis. They're 10 unique people, different genders, different ages, different underlying constitutional issues. Some have digestive issues. Obviously, rheumatoid arthritis, they all have immune problems because they all have an autoimmune disease. But there's all these other underlying components that are not necessarily being addressed. And I would also point out one other thing, again, slightly off topic, but I just think it's worth, worth people knowing. A lot of people have this idea, it's either like herbal medicine or orthodox medicine or CAM medicine versus orthodox medicine. And in my opinion, nothing could be further than the truth. Um, in the years that I've been in clinical practice, I've always worked with physicians. I love working with physicians. What they do and what I do are not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so if, you, if your goal is to help the person, then you have to be open-minded to look at what is the most appropriate treatment for this person at this time for this condition. And sometimes that's orthodox medicine. There's some things they do incredibly well, but then there's some things we do well. And in fact, often it turns out where orthodox medicine is strong tends to be where herbal and complementary medicine is not so strong. But the obverse is true is where herbal medicine is strong, tends to be where orthodox medicine has at its weakest. And so the two together really is an incredible win-win for the patient. And I think there is nothing better than a great physician and a great herbalist working together. Hmm. Yeah, I concur on that. Absolutely. So I guess that brings us to nettle root. Lovely. And if you grow nettles, you have no shortage of nettle root. <laughs> that is true. Um, I, I generally recommend gathering the roots when they are dormant, when the plant is dormant. So that means, and with nettle leaf, by the way, and I didn't say this, with nettle leaf, you want to harvest it in the springtime or in the early autumn if you've cut it back and you get new growth. But nettle leaf, when it gets older, it develops what are called crystalliths. And these are granular structures that can actually irritate the kidney. So you want to get your young nettle leaves in the springtime or after they go to seed, if you cut them back and you have a nice long autumn, you'll get all this new growth and you can gather them again. Nettle root, on the other hand, I want to harvest when the plant is dormant. So when the plant has died back, uh, usually after a nice frost, <clears throat> this year we didn't get a heavy frost until I think the first week of November. Our, our, our first frost used to be in the beginning of October. I live in Pennsylvania. Um, not anymore, at least not usually. It's, it's at least two to three weeks later now for our usual first uh, heavy frost. I still had roses blooming in the first week of November, wow. which is nice. I love roses. <laughs> you do a talk on roses too. Anyway, um, and that's when you want to harvest the roots and you just clean them off. You can cut them. Whereas if you're going to make medicine out of nettle leaf, you can dry the leaves. And I do recommend artificial heat, like a dehydrator for nettle leaf, uh, especially if you live someplace uh, humid like I do in the summertime <coughs> or spring. Uh, you can also tincture nettle leaf, either fresh or dried. Um, there are a lot of people who believe that fresh nettle leaf tincture is a really good antihistamine and really useful for allergies. Personally, I've never found that to be all that useful. Uh, that information originally comes from a company that was making freeze-dried nettle products, um, which do act as an antihistamine, but the effect is actually very short-lived, meaning you take the capsules and it helps clear you up for 15, 20, 30 minutes, and then you usually have to take them again, so it's a short-lived effect. So I, I've never found fresh nettle leaf tincture to be all that great as a sort of antihistamine. I, I think there are things that work better, like fresh eyebright tincture, assuming you can actually get real fresh eyebright tincture. And I would 
warn our listeners, viewers, that at the moment, I do not believe, I cannot find any real Eyebrite in the American marketplace virtually anywhere. Hmm. Every single thing I've tested that has been sent to me as Eyebrite is actually an adulterant uh, hmm. called Red Bartzia or Odotantes, um, which is a real problem. Uh, if you really want your herbs to work, it's kind of important to have the right herb. <laughs> important tip. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, uh, getting back to nettle root. Uh, so anyway, you can you can tincture nettle leaf or net, uh, fresh or dry. I actually prefer the dry nettle leaf. I actually think it makes a better tincture. <laughs> On the other hand, nettle root, there is no benefit out of tincturing the root fresh. You can do it if you want to, but there's no real benefit. There are no... Um, easily damaged constituents. So drying, all you're doing is getting rid of the excess water. Uh, you can make a tea out of nettle root, but I probably use it more often as a tincture. And in fact, I use teas and tinctures more often than any other form of herbal preparation. I do use some glycerates. I do use some standardized extracts, but not a lot of them, a few. Um, I do use some of the Chinese uh, extract granules, uh, which are a handy way of uh, using some Chinese herbs, um, but not all of the products in the marketplace are of equal quality. So um, I, do, I do use tinctures probably more than anything else. And so nettle root tincture has been shown to inhibit the conversion of aromatase. And aromatase is involved with the conversion of testosterone into a secondary metabolite called DHT or dihydrotestosterone. High levels of dihydrotestosterone increase the growth of prostatic tissue, hence benign prostatic hyper hypertrophy or hyperplasia, BPH. And so nettle root can be used to treat um, the aging male prostate um, but one of the things I would say about that, and this is one of the challenges I mentioned earlier that while certain herbs have become popular, herbal medicine has not. The way that a lot of Americans still use herbs is this herb for this disease. When we look at all the world's great herbal traditions, whether we are talking about TCM, Ayurveda, Campo, Jammu, uh, Yunani Tib, Tibetan medicine, physiomedicalism, et cetera. One of the things that we see almost across the board is the use of complex formulas. Why? Because we're dealing with complex people with complex problems. And so what I would say is using nettle root by itself is not that effective. And in fact, one of the things that we often hear about herbs is we hear these little sound bites of information. So saw palmetto is the prostate herb and black cohosh is the menopause herb and St. John's wort is the depression herb. There's only one problem with each of those statements. They're wrong, wrong. Oh, yes. And wrong. <laughs> and what I mean by that is um, so St. John's wort only really works well for three of the more than 14 different types of depression that exist. And so if you're treating depression as a generic entity, your results are never going to be that great. Black cohosh for menopausal symptomology, most of the people I know who have taken it are underwhelmed when they just take black cohosh. Yeah, it helped. Maybe they, I had one less hot flash. Maybe, you know, they're a little less severe. But when you combine herbs properly and create synergy, synergy is, is incredibly vital in traditional herbal medicine. Understanding how with herbs, just throwing them together in a formula does not guarantee synergy. In fact, there's also the opposite, anti-synergy, antagonism. So synergy is one plus one no longer equals two. One plus one equals three, four, five. There's one study that was done 10, 15 years ago showing that herb A and herb B combined increase bioavailability of herb A by 2,000%, meaning one plus one equals 2,000. <laughs> so synergy is knowing how to combine things. So, you know, when we get back to the prostate, everybody thinks saw palmetto is the prostate herb, but saw palmetto by itself is also rather underwhelming. But when you take saw palmetto and you add in some nettle root, 
And then you add in maybe a little bit of fresh collinsonia tincture and then maybe a little bit of mullein root or white sage. Now you have something that is highly effective and much better than saw palmetto as a simple. Hmm. But nettle root is of benefit, as we said, for uh, BPH. And I would also point out that increased levels of DHT are also associated with increased risk of prostatic cancer. Now, I'm not saying if you use nettle root on a regular basis, uh, somebody will not develop prostatic cancer. What I can say pretty safely is if you do that and other things to minimize your risk, for instance, stop smoking, lose weight, you know, little things like that, you can absolutely reduce your risk. And so, you know, what do they say? And, you know, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, you know, anybody who's developed any type of chronic degenerative disease, the reality is uh, it would have been a lot easier to deal with it if you could have prevented it. And so one of the beauties of herbal medicine is it's not just about treating disease. It's about staying healthy and helping to prevent for disease in the future. And herbs can work incredibly well uh, to do that. So let me think. So I guess at this point, we come to nettle seed. And <clears throat> I have to tell you two stories to fully give sort of credence and, and, and uh, so people understand how this came about. So one of my teachers when I was young was one of my uncles and one of my aunts, and they lived in North Carolina. And my uncle was more of a, we'll call him a folk healer. And my aunt was, uh, was an herbalist. And um, my uncle one time, he told me, he says, you know, if you ever don't know what herb to give somebody, what you do, he called it a walking meditation. He said, you'd walk through the woods and the fields thinking about the person who needed help, but keeping your eyes open. And sooner or later, a plant would announce that it could help that person by shaking. And my response to that was, hmm, that's very interesting, but I was the herbalist. So I, you know, usually I, I, I knew what I wanted to give people, or at least I thought I knew what I wanted to give people. Um, the arrogance of youth. So I never used it. <clears throat> so one day, I'm visiting some friends in Churchville, Virginia. Uh, I was teaching a class for them. And it was in the morning. And um, it was pretty, it was like, well, they had electricity. But it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty primitive, uh, simple living conditions. Uh, there was no bathroom. And so I woke up in the morning and I had to use the outhouse. And I'm just wearing my underwear and my shirt because nobody's around. And I go out to the outhouse and there's a sign on the door that says out of order. And I'm looking at this. And I'm going, OK, well, I look around and everywhere I can see is poison ivy everywhere. <laughs> and there are worse places to get poison ivy than on the soles of your feet and between your toes, but not many. <laughs> and I'm kind of hopping from foot to foot because I really have to go and I don't want to walk through the poison ivy with bare feet because I am sensitive to poison ivy. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see this bush and it's shaking back and forth. <laughs> and I look at it and for a moment, I'm kind of not noticing that I need to go to the bathroom. And I'm looking going, is there a bird in there? Is there a squirrel, a chipmunk, a raccoon, a whatever? And I walk over there thinking something's going to fly away, run away, nothing. And then I look down and realize, we're, and there's no wind. And where this bush is shaking is the only place there's no poison ivy. So I went in there, took care of what I need to take care of. And from that moment, I have believed if you have a need, the plants will provide. So fast forward a decade or so. And I'm out by my old farm. And I'm sitting out by the barn. And um, there was a big, big nettle patch past the barn. And it was one of these, this was in uh, northwestern New Jersey, and um, it's one of these summer days. It's about 122% humidity. I know there's nothing over 100%, but it felt like it. 
and it's probably 92 degrees, not a breeze to be found. It is hot, and I'm sitting in the shade by the barn, and I'm thinking about a patient of mine who's got degenerative kidney disease. She had glomerular nephritis. And she had been to all sorts of nephrologists. She had been all over the place. And I was kind of a last resort because often back then, but even till today, even this day, you know, herbalists are in many cases not people's first choice. They often wind up with an herbalist because they've tried everything else. And so I'm thinking about her and I had put her initially on a GCM formula called the Romania 6 formula. And this formula for people with degenerative kidney disease will often kind of plateau them. It'll keep them from getting worse and it'll work for maybe a year, a year and a half, two years tops, and then it stops working. And so she'd been on it for about a year and three or four months and her latest um, um, uh, glomerular filtration rate and and BUN and creatinine had you know her kidney function had dropped it had gone from 18 to 16 and i knew at this point the formula had stopped working and you know at this point she's got about maybe 6 9 months the way she was going before she's on dialysis and why dialysis will save your life it is incredibly expensive even though insurance usually covers it it's still a very expensive process and for many people who are in dialysis, they feel lousy a lot of the time. And in fact, from what I've read uh, in the medical literature, the average lifespan of someone, once somebody goes on dialysis is about five years. Hmm. So I'm thinking about this woman and I feel really bad because I don't know of anything else to do for her. I've, this, is, this was the last thing I, this is all that I had. I know she'd already been everywhere else. There's nobody I can think of to refer her to. And as a clinician, you know, for everybody who's listening as a clinician, never be embarrassed to say you don't know or you don't have all the answers. And if you know, if there's somebody who can do something better than you, refer them. You know, we, we, nobody knows everything. And in fact, at best, we know a fraction of what there is to know. Anyway, I, I'm feeling like, there's got to be something that will help her, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know who to, you know, to, to send her to. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see that the nettles plants are waving at me. Hmm. So what do I think? Is there a bird? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a slow learner. Is there a bird? Is there a squirrel? Is there a rabbit? Is there a chipmunk? You know, I get up. I walk over to the nettles patch. Nothing flies out. Nothing runs away. And in my head, in my mind's ear, I hear, I can help her. And I'm like, uh, okay. And I think, well, nettle leaf is great for, you know, hematuria and minor kidney pain, but it's not going to treat glomerular nephritis. And then I hear, not my leaves, and it was also in August, wrong time to gather the leaves, by the way. I hear, not my leaves, my seeds, and they kind of gently rustle. Hmm. So I picked my jaw off the floor, off the ground. <laughs> I went back to the house, got some tobacco, which I use as a ritual offering to the plants, came back, made an offering, put some gloves on, and I gathered a whole bunch of the nettle seed, which was beautifully ripe. Came back to the house, tinctured it up, let it sit a couple weeks, pressed it out. And I called up my patient. And I said, listen, I've got this thing. It's very experimental, but I don't believe in any way, shape or form it will harm you. And if you'd like to give it a try, I'll give it to you and we can see what happens. And the only thing I knew about nettle seed at this point, which gave me some comfort, is I'd never read about it being used medicinally, even though later I found out that it actually had some tradition of use, not common, but it did have some tradition of use. But I knew that in Europe, it was used as an emergency food during famines and people could survive on it. So I knew it was not toxic. So I gave her the nettle tincture and a month goes by and she has her next test because she's being tested monthly and she's back to 18% kidney function from 16 Okay. There's usually a little variation. That that doesn't tell me anything yet. The next month goes by, she stays at 18. 
That's good. The next month goes by, she's up to like 19. The next month goes by, she's up to 20. 21, 22, 24. Eventually, she gets up to 28% kidney function. Her nephrologist says to her, are you doing something? She says, yeah, I'm taking it. He says, I don't even want to know. <laughs> Just keep doing it. I actually thought that was a really weird response. But okay. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> she continued to take nettle seed. And she was like in her late 60s. And for 12 years, it kept her between 26 and 28% kidney function. And at about 82, she died of something totally unrelated to kidney mm -hmm. failure. That was my first experience with nettle seed. The next one was about six months later when a Native American woman called me and said that she had degenerative kidney disease and did I know anything? And I was like, well, you know, sometimes something works for one person, but it's not necessarily going to work for everybody. In fact, I'm really, it's one area where I'm quite conservative in that just because something works once or twice doesn't mean it's going to work again. Uh, I had this experience and I, for me, if, if something, I learned something new, I want to see it work repeatedly over and over and over again. 30, 40, 50 times where it's worked, you know, 65, 70% of the time before I start telling anybody else about it and saying that this is real. Because I've seen all too many times where something helped one person, but then, then, then you give it to 10 more people and it doesn't do anything for them. So great for that first person, but that doesn't, that's not proof. It's mm -hmm. all it was, is it was a benefit for that one person. It doesn't mean it's going to be beneficial down the line. After five years, I probably had well over a dozen cases. At this point, I, I, I'd guess 50, 60, 70, 80. I don't even know. I, I've never counted of cases of people with degenerative kidney disease uh, where nettle seed has, in most cases, been remarkable. Now, I've learned some things about nettle seed in the process. Number one, it, um, it does not work for polycystic kidney disease. I don't know why it doesn't. Um, the, my understanding of nettle seed, there's not a lot of information about this, but I did come across one report where they found out that there were compounds known as lectins in nettle seed that have an affinity, had an affinity for the nephrons of the kidney. So I believe that is one of the major ways that it works. It does contain a lot of fatty acids, um, which generally tend to have uh, anti-inflammatory effects. I would also point out that these days I rarely use nettle seed as a simple, even though that's how I started off using it, both to understand it and to really see whether it worked. I tend to use it with a Chinese uh, mushroom called cordyceps. Uh, today, I would recommend the cordyceps militaris because the Ophio cordyceps sinensis costs more than $7,000 a kilo. And I don't know anybody who can afford a medicine that, that is that expensive. The uh, cordyceps militaris is much less expensive, but works. Um, I also use it combined with a Chinese herb called Huangqi or astragalus, another Chinese herb called Danshen or Salvia miltioriza. Uh, those are two herbs I commonly, uh, three herbs I commonly combine it with. And there are a few others. There is a, a relative of nettles from the UK called Pellitory of the Wall, which could be used here. Um, you have Chinese dogwood fruit can potentially be used here. Um, very small amounts of rhubarb, interestingly enough. The Chinese dahuang uh, have some benefit. There are a number of other herbs that have been shown and proven to have significant nephroprotective, kidney protective effects. But of all the kidney tropho restoratives, and a tropho restorative, it's a physiomedicalist term. Think of it as a food for an organ or a tissue that strengthens and nourishes that organ or tissue. In my mind, nettle seed is by far the greatest kidney trophoe restorative we have. 
and those other herbs are supportive herbs. Number two would be cordyceps, but they support each other and work really well together. I would also point out that I don't just use this for humans. Um, I have many, I don't personally work with animals. Um, I'm not a veterinarian or herbal vet, a veterinarian or, or animal herbalist, <clears throat> but I teach a lot of veterinarians. Uh, in my two-year herb studies program, I almost always have between four and 10 veterinarians per class. And so I've learned a lot about animal medicine from them because they know animal medicine. I don't, um, but I've learned quite a bit. And I mean, I've had, I've had companion animals over the years and I've certainly used them on my companion animals, but that's a very limited experience. And I cannot tell you how many stories I have heard and seen read case histories of cats and dogs with late stage degenerative kidney disease where the animal has stopped eating, has basically, and the vet or the owner will like pry open their mouth and mix some of the nettle seed tincture with water. And if you, with cats, you have to dilute it very heavily because cats really are not very good at breaking down alcohol and they will foam at the mouth. The foaming part is not the problem. It looks weird, but it, it, that's not the problem. It's just that they, they don't have the ability to break down alcohol well. So you mix it in with things like heavily dilute it with tuna fish juice and things <laughs> like that. Which they're very happy to take. And I, I, I cannot tell you how many stories I have of dogs and cats who literally were probably no more than, you know, days or weeks away from dying, who recovered and lived for years. Mm -hmm. I've seen it over and over again. I also have two reports. I have not done this myself. I do not make any claims here, but I have two reports from herbalists who I know very well and trust that they were able to get people on dialysis off dialysis using nettle seed. Now, I would need to have a lot more cases of that to say that I was really confident of that, but I am really confident that for things like glomerular nephritis, chronic nephritis with degeneration, i.e. Berger's disease, uh, for diabetic nephropathy, now obviously you also have to control the blood sugar there, but mm -hmm. for those types of conditions, nettle seed is absolutely brilliant. Hmm. And, you know, I, I've had people say, well, you discovered it. I didn't discover it. I just listened. The plants hmm. told me. And the truth is they are living beings and they know so much more than we will ever know. And so opening your mind to listen. And yes, I'm a big fan of research and science and looking at the old literature and clinical experience, but never downplay the importance of learning to listen to the plants Plants can communicate if you understand how to listen, as well as gaining information from dreams or vision, <laughs> things like that. I mean, these are all ways that people throughout the world have gained knowledge about plants, and I'm open to all of them. You know, it's not, it's herbal medicine. There's an art, there's a spiritual practice, there's a science, and they are all equally valid. Don't sit there and pigeon yourself, hole yourself into one way of seeing the world because it means that as much as that can show you, there are other things that you are not seeing and you are missing. And so I firmly believe if you have a need, the plants will respond. Hmm. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for all of that nettle wisdom and also other herbal wisdom that was sprinkled throughout. I had to like stop myself at times not to pick up a notebook. Luckily this is recorded so I can take notes later. <laughs> um, I do want to talk about some of the offerings you have um, before we get to the last question, which I'm very mm -hmm. excited to hear from you about. Um, I do want to mention, um, as I mentioned in the intro, you have many wonderful books out there, Adaptogens, which was previously published in the early 2000s, has been re-released in 2019. And that new is edition. a book, new, new edition. edition. New edition, that's what we should say. That one is just, I mean, I think... I, my own copy is so dog-eared and I've read it so many times. It's certainly a really important book. Another one, which I sometimes feel like doesn't get all the credit that it could, is Herbal Therapy and Supplements, which I think the last time this was published was 2008. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, any chance that we might get a new edition of this, David? 
I wish the publishers don't seem to be. This was a major publisher. This was Lippincott, Williams, and Wilkins. And for there, there was two editions. The first edition came out, and then we had a second uh, improved edition. And I was hoping they would go for a third edition, but they never did. And I, I don't understand why, because it was actually sold very well. Yeah, I'll I, give I them think, a call. I'll, I'll talk to them. Do um, you know them? No, oh. <laughs> I don't. but I do. You know what I love about this? Because I know, you know, we have the Botanical Safety Handbook now, which has been more recent release. But I love about this is it's thorough and the size of it is just really nice, especially for people who aren't ready to invest $120 into a huge textbook. Um, but even though this is from 2008, I still refer to it all the time. It's such a, there's so many herbs covered and it'll give me a great, you know, quick glance at things that are really important. So um, that's one of my favorites. I would actually love to do a new edition of that book. There's so many cool updates that could be added, new herbs that could be added, but who knows? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll cross my fingers for that. And uh, I know we've mentioned Herbalist and Alchemist, but I just want to do that officially. Uh, I'm a huge fan. I think your um, ability to formulate, as you're talking about synergy, I mean, you're just absolutely brilliant with that. Uh, when I was in clinical practice, which I'm not anymore, but when I was in clinical practice, I heavily relied on that. I, I saw mostly long distance clients. And so I would send them to you for those formulations. Um, mm -hmm. And there's just, yeah, they're absolutely brilliant. People can visit uh, online, look at those. Uh, like a great example is if you look at the respiratory section, there's all the different lung, you know, there's, it's not like, here's the lung formula, right? This is David Winston's take. So there's all these different lung formulas for dry, for antispasmodic, for congestion. So there's so much there with your formulations and Herbalist and Alchemist is a fabulous company. Uh, so there's that that I wanted to make sure we mentioned. And would you like to say a few words about your practitioner program? Sure. Well, just for getting back to Herbalist and Alchemist, uh, if people want to look at the website, it's herbalist-alchemist.com. We just moved to our new facility, much, much Congrats. larger. It will help us to actually keep things in stock and produce things on a higher level, not a higher level, but in greater volume and maintaining the same same quality. Um, I think, goodness gracious, Herbalist and Alchemist, is, this will be 40, 41 years, I guess, we've been in business. Anyway, um, you know, we started the company because, not because I wanted an herb company. I never wanted a company. I'm not a business person, but I couldn't get good products for my patients. And when you make products, there's a certain scale of volume or volume of scale you may need to make a fairly large amount to make it practical. And then I was like, well, what do I do with this? And I said, oh, I'll start an herb company. Like I had any idea what that entailed. <laughs> anyway, the two-year herb studies program is the David Winston Center for Herbal Studies. It is a two-year clinical herb studies program. And, you know, there's a lot more herb schools out there. And there's some really wonderful herb schools out there. Don't, you know, I'm not saying that this is the only school that is worth going to. There are so many good herbal programs, which is so different than when I started when there were literally none. But what I will say is myself and the other instructors um, combined probably have close to 200 years of clinical experience. Um, and it's just a remarkable, it's now pretty much fully online. Uh, it used to be either live or online. And we, we, we all still do a few classes and herb walks that are live, but you know we have students literally all over the world. So it doesn't matter where somebody is, they can take the program. Uh, I'd say about half of our students are already medical professionals. They're MDs, DOs, NDs, veterinarians, acupuncturists, chiropractors, nutritionists, dentists, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, etc. cetera. Uh, and Really amazingly, we have we we get a number of really incredible high level herbalists who are people who are really well known who just think that hey, it's always good to continue your education. And I, I'm one of those people. It's like if if I haven't learned something new in a day, I haven't been. It wasn't a, it wasn't a great day. And then the other half of the students are people who are just been fascinated by herbs, sometimes for a year or two and sometimes for decades. And they just want to take it to the next level to be able to actually work with people on a more clinical level. So uh, it's a wonderful program. The, um, the next 
uh, program. It's every two years. So the next program doesn't start till September of 2024. But we already have applications for that next class. And uh, we're planning probably to do probably maybe one, possibly two in the next two years, independent uh, intensives that will be open to anybody. Uh, where it will be myself and, and, and probably one other teacher and we'll do like an entire weekend just on herbal gastroenterology or herbal neurology or something, you know, of that topic. And it will be a sort of high level clinical uh, training program. And, um, yeah, I, th I think that that's pretty much what I'd want to say about the school. And uh, I, I, it's just for me, my first two year herb studies program was in 1980. And I had two students and I was thrilled because back then this was something that most people just weren't interested in. And the fact that anybody wanted to learn this to me was just the most wonderful thing that I had somebody to share it with and pass it on. And, and it's just wonderful because, you know, now, uh, so 43 years later, it was 43rd year of the school, um, we have this incredible herbal community that really started out mostly in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, people who were close enough to commute, although we had students coming crazy distances. We had people driving once a week from Massachusetts, West Virginia, Virginia. I thought they were crazy, but they thought they thought it was worthwhile. Georgia, you had somebody fly in every week from Georgia. I, I was like, really? <laughs> um, but now people can be, again, anywhere uh, and, and take the program. and. I'm just as excited at teaching people and sharing this information because, again, what I know now, oh, my goodness, I have so much more experience and, and so much more to share than I did when, in 1982 or 1992 or 2002 or 2012. Mm -hmm. And I just keep trying to learn as much as I can. And um, the other thing I would tell everybody, because I know your question is going to be what to do. Don't just study with one teacher. You know, there, you could say that there, there's this old kind of joke. You know, if you have if you have uh, five of the, whatever group of people, you get 15 different opinions. Well, that is absolutely true of herbalists. That is absolutely <laughs> true. My dear friend Rosemary Glasser said the only thing that herbalists agree on is not to use aluminum cookware, and uh, pretty much true. There are so many approaches, so many ways of seeing things, and I would be loath to say that there are many ways that are wrong. There probably are not very many. I mean, there are some people who are telling people things that are just simply not true. But for the most part, you have the American herbal community is an incredibly creative, um, varied, diverse and brilliant group of people who I feel incredibly fortunate to have spent most of my life in that community, hanging out, learning, growing, sharing. And so if you take a program, that's fantastic. There's lots of good programs out there, but I would never stop at just one, you know, in most programs, you'll probably benefit by doing something else with somebody else, or at the very least, going to herbal conferences and going to as many different teachers' classes as you possibly can. So you get a sense of who you sort of like in the sense of their teaching style, but also that you hear different things because I can only talk, I mean, I can tell you about the research. I can tell you about my experience. I can tell you about um, what's in the literature, especially, you know, in the ethnobotanical literature or the eclectics or the physiomedicalist, but that is still a narrow slice of what is there to know. So, and never, never, and this really goes to your last question, never stop learning. <laughs> Well, thank you, David. Yeah, you, you began talking about how in your early studies, you took every herbal hallucinogen that you could find. So, um, and that did not seem to maybe go over so well in the end. That was a learning experience. Um, yeah, so, one I wouldn't recommend repeating, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So your your tips for where to start for people who are just starting out on their herbal path is uh, learn from many teachers and never stop learning. 
Never stop learning, learn from many teachers. And if you find somebody whose work really resonates with you, then go as deeply as you can with that person. But remember something, every tradition has its strengths and weaknesses. So for instance, I, I've been trained in traditional Chinese medicine as one of the traditions I, 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 I you know, have some knowledge of. But what I would say is just because it's part of TCM doesn't mean I always agree with it. There are things that I learned in TCM that I vehemently disagree with because in clinical practice, it just hasn't proven to be true. One of my other early teachers was one of, in my opinion, one of the greatest herbalists of the American herbalists of the 20th century. And his name was William Lasassier. Mm -hmm. And William was brilliant. I mean, William is the person who introduced me to the concept of energetics. William's the person who introduced me to Chinese herbs, although he didn't use a lot of them, but he used, you know, processed romania and astragalus and, um, you know, uh, acacia buds and white peony. And these are herbs I knew nothing about it when I studied with him. Uh, he was very eclectic in the sense of the meaning of the word, not the eclectic physicians. But I mean, he did all sorts of things. He was a brilliant diagnostician, but he also did palmistry and numerology and, and you, you know, you name it. He also did a lot of diagnostics. And some of the diagnostics I learned from him, I used in practice for about 10 or 12 years until I just realized I wasn't really seeing it. You know, it's like I believed it when I learned it and I tried it. But don't be afraid if something just doesn't work for you to say, Matt, never mind. And so, you know, over the years, I learned iridology, but I just didn't see it really panning out. And so I stopped using it. I learned applied kinesiology, which I think as a bodywork technique is fantastic. But as a diagnostic technique, I am totally disagree that it is an effective technique at all. But if, it, if something works for you, it works for you. If it works in your clinical practice, don't let anybody tell you that it's, you know, unless you're hurting people or you're not getting results, if something works for you, that's phenomenal. But don't be afraid to question, to say, hmm, I've tried that not once or twice, but I've tried it a hundred times and it's, I just don't, I don't get results with it. Then you know what? Find something new find something else. So be open to change. Don't develop. I think as a clinician, the worst disease you can get is what I call hardening of the mind. And hardening of the mind is where you start believing that everything you know is true. <laughs> be open to the possibility that everything you believe and quote unquote know is subject to change. It doesn't mean it will, but you're open to the possibility. You're open to learning new things. And so I'll just give you one quick example few years ago, I was redoing my paper on treating migraines. And the old theory of treating migraines is migraines were vasoconstrictive, vasodilative, or both. And I can't say that I never had success treating people with migraines. I had some success. But I have to say that the success rates that I had were not where I would have liked to have seen them, uh, especially for people who had what I believed at the time were vasoconstrictive slash vasodilative migraines, where you had both patterns. Those people just, just didn't respond at all. Well, when I started looking, and again, I said two years, it might be three or four, kind of time all blends together for me in this big amorphous past. <laughs> but I started looking into the new research on migraines, and it turns out that migraines are not vasodilative or vasoconstrictive. That's the result of the migraine. That doesn't cause the migraine. The migraine causes the vasodilation and vasoconstriction. And so if you're trying to treat the underlying pathophysiology, then you have to find a whole new model. And I came up with the more TCM way of looking at it, of what I call excess heat or deficiency cold migraines. And I had to redo my whole way of approaching migraines and thinking about migraines. And it's been fantastic because my ability to help people who are experiencing migraines has improved dramatically because I have now a better understanding of what's really happening. So be open to learning new things. On the other hand, I think that there is some benefit to being conservative. And I mean this in the best sense of the word of cons to conserve. 
So not only being careful as to where you get your herbs and, you know, making sure that they're sustainably harvested or organically cultivated, things like that, but also in, and I mentioned this before, just because I learned something. I remember speaking to a well-known author one time, herbalist author, and hearing, and, and they had written a book about their approach to treating something. And I, I looked at the book and I wasn't all that impressed. And I asked them, I said, well, how many people have you actually treated with this? And their answer was one themselves. And I have no problem with that, except that nowhere in the book did it actually say that. Meaning the book gave you the impression that this was a, based on lots and lots of clinical experience, when in reality, that wasn't the case at all. And so, as I said before, I tend to be really conservative. And final story, I, I, ref, I was referring to this before, but I didn't tell you the story. So I had read somebody wrote a article talking about making a vinegar extract of blood root to use it for athlete's foot. And while nobody dies of athlete's foot, well, possibly people with really severe diabetes who have, you know, get infections in the feet, but athlete's foot is one of the things really annoying and really hard to treat. If you've ever tried, oh yeah, tea tree. Yeah, well, as soon as you stop using the tea tree, the athlete's foot comes right back. Mm -hmm. So I had never had anything that I thought was greatly successful in treating athlete's foot. Although I will admit one of my first products before Herbalist and Alchemist, I called my company Herbal Therapeutics Incorporated. And I used to make a product called Herbalist Foot. And it actually worked pretty good. The problem is it made your shoes smell to high heaven it made your feet smell to high heaven in your socks. And the only way to get the smell out was to throw your socks and shoes away. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> so even though it worked really well, it was not a success as a product. <laughs> anyway, so, and I also knew that in a lot of Southeastern ethnobotanical traditions, horse, uh, um, uh, uh, actually, excuse me, ex I'm sorry. It was not bloodroot vinegar. It was horsetail vinegar. I knew in a lot of Southeastern traditions that um, horsetail was used for fungal infections as well. So based on that, I made up a batch of horsetail vinegar, although actually bloodroot was in the other product as well as horsetail, bloodroot, et cetera. And I gave it to a, a patient of mine who had athlete's foot and their athlete's foot went away. I had like, it was the best treatment of athlete's foot I'd ever seen. Then I gave it to a second person and it didn't totally go away, but it really cleared up pretty quickly. And I started telling people, this stuff is amazing. It's great. It's wonderful. Breaking my own rule. I, I try never to do that. Well, then I gave it to the third person, the fourth person, the fifth person, the sixth person, the seventh person, the eighth person, the ninth person, the tenth person. And in all, you know, two out of two is remarkable. But when it gets to be two out of ten, hmm. you're below placebo level. Because for everybody else I gave it to, it hardly worked at all. Hmm. So my suggestion is, you know, be conservative in that, you know, you try things. If it works, great. Does it work consistently? And that doesn't mean 100% of the time. Nothing works 100% of the time. But does it work most of the time repeatedly with similar conditions? And if you see it over 20 or 30 or 50 or 80 or 100 cases, at that point, then I start feeling really comfortable saying this really works. And so I try never to exaggerate or to um, uh, claim things unless that I have seen them enough that I am convinced that it really works. Hmm. Which is one of the many reasons I love learning from you, David. <laughs> <laughs> this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for generously spending your time with us. It's just, it's been an honor for me and I would love to have you back on the show again. Well, I have enjoyed myself thoroughly and I would love to come back. So you let me know the time and uh, we'll make it happen. All right. Sounds wonderful. Thanks again, Thank David. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to David's recipe for a green powder spice blend. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can find David many places online, including his website, herbalstudies.net and herbalists-alchemist.com. See the show notes for handy links to his websites and social. 
If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this lovely prickly plant. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad to have you here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.